The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, New Testament scholar Dr. Douglas Campbell helps explain the Book of Romans by focusing on its central chapters. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thanks for being here. You're welcome. You've done a lot of work on the Book of Romans, as evidenced by this huge book that reminds me of a Harry Potter book. It's so big. Yes. And absolutely I'm sorry. just as scintillating. You do a lot of work in the book on uh, the Book of Romans. And tell us about the gospel as it springs out of Romans 5 through 8, where you spend a great deal of time. Well, I think Romans 5 through 8 is really where Paul tells us uh, what really matters to him. Uh, it's where he tells us what God is really like. And the reason why this happens is because in those chapters, he's addressing a couple of very, very important questions. I think there are two. I think he's being challenged by somebody who is trying to frighten the Christians that he's looking after and scare them and intimidate them with a future judgment scenario. He's trying to make them feel insecure. And the other question is he's being challenged by somebody who is accusing him of libertinism. Um, according to your gospel, Paul, how can Christians actually behave in a good fashion? They seem to be out of control, uh, riotously living. I mean, they're pagans. They don't really know anything about behaving correctly. They're not proper Jews. So Paul pushes back on both these challenge is very, very hard. And at the basis of both of these pushbacks is Christology. And so he says, the reason why we can be secure against the coming judgment is because the God who does not spare his only son, but gives him up for us all, uh, can be trusted to take us through any judgment process. And in the judgment, He'll be on our side. He won't be on the other side. So you can be completely assured when you face the future. Secondly, the God who has not spared his only son, but has given him up to die for us, has also transformed us so that we can behave uh, in a way that we need to behave. He's, he's taken us. He's entered into our condition. Um, he's really terminated. He's executed the stuff that was getting in the way. He's resurrected us into a new condition. He's joined us to that new condition, not only in the Son, but through the Spirit. And this leads to the only sort of right behavior that is valid and authentic. So Romans 5 to 8 is really where we see the heart of the Pauline Gospel. Well, isn't that pretty much the opposite of the way most of us have tended to look <laughs> at, scaring me down. at the Gospel? In other words... The, the gospel is usually presented with the idea that let's make people understand there's going to be a judgment and make them afraid right. of that judgment. Right. Right. So people respond to the gospel, as it were, right. Right. because they're afraid of the judgment. They want to escape it, and they've got to do something to escape it, which is have faith in somebody that's going to mm. help them. And then you turn right around and try to maintain mm. that position of escape by mm. trying to behave better. And the way you're describing yeah. five, Romans 5 through 8 is yeah. the opposite of that. Well, people have just got Paul very, very wrong. And if what he's saying in Romans 5 to 8 is right, then the model that you've just described, which is widespread, uh, there has to be something wrong with it uh, as a presentation of Paul. Now, it could be that Paul was horribly muddled up, and on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, he was the good Christological thinker that we think he was. And on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays, he was the other guy. And on Sundays, he had the day off, you know. <laughs> but um, I think when you plant your flag in Romans 5 through 8, and that's really where we need to plant our flag because that's where he's doing all his work out of Christology. That's where he's talking about God in the light of Christ. Uh, and so that is solid information. If you plant your flag in Romans 5 to 8, what you end up with is another perspective on the model that you've just outlined for me, which is usually articulated in relation to, to Romans 1 to 4. And that's where we're confronted with Christ died for us while we're still sinners. Right. 
Uh, Drum is five. And we're confronted five. with all of the, if he's already done this much for you, how much more is he right. going to see it through exactly. to the end, yeah. and et cetera. And the judgment is usually thought of as something scary, like a final right. exam. Right. Uh, yeah. What if I don't pass? Right. Yeah. But exactly. we're really talking about mm. the judgment being a good thing mm. and exactly. something to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the judgment's already taken place, I think, in the cross. And when Paul talks about Christ assuming what we are, the, the sinful nature, the flesh, as he calls it, the sarks in the Greek, and terminating it and cutting it off and executing it, that is a judgment. That's God's judgment that this situation cannot continue and must stop. So the, the hostile part of the judgment really is behind us. So when we talk about any future judgment, I think there's a moment of accountability that's coming. Paul is absolutely clear that we will stand before Jesus on the last day, and we'll have to give some sort of account for ourselves, and that will be a potentially quite excoriating occasion, I think. Could elicit some embarrassment. Uh, but I don't think it's a hostile judgment. I don't think it's a judgment where God is going to say, well, you know, you've tried hard, you've been a Christian, you've done all the things you were meant to do, but... It's not going to be one of those sorts of judgments where our deeds are weighed in the balance. And I think you can't get away from the argument of Romans 8, which I think is the finest chapter that he ever wrote, and think anything different. The God who is giving up his own son for us, giving us the spirit, is, is on our side all the way through, all the way down, uh, right through to the end. So we really don't need to fear. We really should be living lives of joyful assurance. But the, the bit that you're worried about is, is, is the bit of Paul that's coming through from chapter 2, coming through from Romans 2. And so the, the big problem is what do we do with Romans 2 when we're really rooted in Romans 5 through 8? Are we talking about the same gospel at all? Uh, and this is where I think the controversies come from. This is what I was trying to deal with in my book, really. So what is it about Romans 1, 2, 3 that seems to be in contrast with what we're reading in 5 through 8? Romans 1 to 3 is usually read in a certain way. There's, there's a consensus out there, what I call the usual reading or the traditional reading. It's in most of the commentators. Uh, and these commentators tend to assume that Paul is, as we put it, thinking forwards. Um, and he's building up a picture of the gospel from a problem. And he articulates a problem uh, and then he matches a solution to that problem. Uh, so really all the hard work and all the critical theological moves are, are taking place in the definition of the problem. Now, if you think that this is the way that you should be preaching the gospel, you will find that reading in Romans 1 to 3 because it works reasonably well. There is a guy running around there who preaches forwards. There is a guy running around there who has quite a harsh, punitive understanding of God, quite a conditional understanding uh, of salvation. So you'll find it because it's a reasonably good fit. But You mean that, that the language of these chapters yeah, comes it, across as though there is a there is a fear of a judgment to come and yeah, a punitive... Yeah. Something's uh, going on there that's talking about this future punitive day of judgment. Something, some sort of system where you are being threatened with a future evaluation. So you, you live in a situation of, of fundamental insecurity now, building towards this final day of judgment. It's there, it's there in Romans 1 to 3. The question is, has the argument been understood correctly if you attribute all of that to Paul? And I think when you have a very clear-sighted understanding of Romans 5 through 8, what you find when you come to Romans 1 to 4 is there are little hints and clues in the text that this is not what he was trying to do. He's not the person that's setting up this problem and, and pushing people through to a solution. He's going after somebody who talks this way. So it's actually almost the opposite of the way he's always been read, or almost always been read. So in other words, in 1 through 3, we're reading his presentation of the very argument that he's arguing against in 5 through 8. Right, exactly. Yeah. Paul is setting up somebody, uh, but he starts off setting them up um, in a Socratic way, which was typical in the ancient world, where he's using the assumptions of this person and, and driving them against one another to, to show so how this gospel the collapses. back and forth uh, like a dialogue right. of Socrates. Right. Yeah, 
Right, right. So he's pushing back on a religious person in Romans 1 to 3, which, which sounds too good to be true. When I tell people, oh, you know, we've misunderstood what Paul's getting at here. It's not really as negative as, as people think. And they go, well, how can you be sure? Actually, it makes better sense of the text because there are these little problems in the text that we've known about for a long time, but we haven't known what to do with them. Uh, so we've done what the, the scholars say, we've anaesthetized them or narcotized them. We've just passed over the top of them and pretended that they're well, not let's there. Let's go ahead and go over, uh, look at an example. Or two. Well, there's a stack of them, but let me, let me run you through a couple of them. The, the, the first problem is that when Paul starts off his tirade in Romans 1, 18 through 32, it's a very dense, aggressive bit of prose. And I think when you read it in the Greek, what you hear is kind of a texture that isn't quite Paul. It's a little bit like you're reading through a Stephen King book, should you read a Stephen King book, <laughs> and you hit a paragraph that's written by Jane Austen, and you would go, oh, something funny's going on here. Somebody is talking in another voice. It's quite an aggressive voice. Then, chapter two, we hit somebody who's talking in this way. Now, who is that person? Well, tradition has usually said, this guy is a Jew. He's not only a Jew, he's the Jew. So what Paul is doing is he's attacking Judaism here. So that the way we get to be a Christian is we learn first what it is to be a Jew, which is to be justified by works, and we fail, and then we sort of flip out of that into Christianity. But when we read what Paul does with this Jew in this text, we build up a picture that isn't really quite right. It's, it's not really fair. He accuses the Jew uh, from verse 17 onwards of being somebody who uh, robs temples, who commits adultery, who is a thief, who is a terrible hypocrite. Now, how many Jews do you know that rob banks, um, sleep with the wrong people on the wrong occasions, this sort of thing? It's, it's, it's a hostile exaggeration. Not all Jews do this. Most Jews don't. So the person that Paul's going after here probably isn't your ordinary, everyday Jew. It's somebody else. Now, if I told you the Jews are very upset around about the time Paul was writing this letter because 20 years previously, the Roman emperor had kicked them out of Rome. Uh, imagine a decree coming down from Governor Schwarzenegger saying all Christians must leave the city of Los Angeles. This would cause quite a trauma, right? So in 19 CE, all the Jews were kicked out of Rome because three Jews had seduced a Roman noblewoman and taken money that she had promised to the Jerusalem temple and absconded with it themselves. So they were thieving, temple robbing, adulterous Jews. Now I think that explains what's going on in this text. So Paul is not targeting everybody who's a Jew. He's targeting people who come to Rome who pretend to be Jewish teachers and really aren't. Okay? So this kind of fits into the argument that he's developing where he's going after somebody else. Then if we read on a little bit further, we suddenly have a little to and fro between Paul and this other person. The first guy is going, I believe in desert, I believe in judgment. The other guy is going, I believe in the faithfulness and the compassion and the graciousness of God. The first guy goes, no, even if you sin, God is not going to rescue you on the day of judgment. Desert must hold. It must hold good. The other com guy comes back and goes, but, but surely if we're sinful and we get rescued, this shows that God is a compassionate God. It goes back and forth like this. Now, the usual reading thinks that Paul is the guy that's insisting on judgment and desert. How can that guy, Paul, turn around in chapters 9 through 11 and say, God loves Israel, and even though Israel is disobedient, will rescue Israel, will not lose faith with Israel. How can the guy saying the opposite in chapter 3 turn around and suddenly say something else in Romans 11? Well, my reading, it's the other guy that's insisting on judgment and desert. Paul is the guy that's saying, what about the faithfulness of God? What about the compassion of God? What about the love of God for people who sin? Okay, so these little clues add up to uh, a new understanding of this text where Paul is attacking someone who's, who's fundamentally religious, fundamentally conditional and contractual. So that, that's summarizing an awful lot of information, and you might just have to buy the book and read it if you want to find <laughs> out all about it. Now, it's a very long book. Yeah, and, it is a little uh, long. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I did my best. 
you must have felt that the entire argument needed to be in one volume rather than breaking it into, say, three volumes or two volumes. Right, um, yeah. So that right. it would be right, right. unable to actually get everything into it unless it were all together. Yeah, I thought hard about breaking it um, into two books, but uh, what, what's going on when we read Paul, uh, even though we're often not aware of it, is, is we're bringing what we've been taught to the text. And it's structuring the way that we read the text, uh, e even when we're not aware of it. Uh, we've been raised and taught that Paul teaches a certain sort of a gospel. And the way that we've often been taught Paul, and I'm referring to the wrong way, is a way that often also resonates with our culture and even with our politics. So the slightly harsh understanding of Paul resonates with the slightly harsh side to, to American culture to American politics, to Western politics. So how would you describe that then, this harsh side of Paul? What's a summary of uh, that it's, way of um, it? It's all about compassion being directed to a limited group who has done certain things to earn that compassion and benevolence and everybody else on the outside being exposed to, to desert and if necessary just to punishment. So if you contract into a privileged group by doing certain things, then you'll be okay. But everybody else basically just has to sink or swim by themselves. And if they sink, what that means usually in social and cultural terms is they're going to be punished somehow. And this is how we run our politics. And it is how we run a lot of our culture. And this is how we've been taught Paul. So part of the length of the book was to show uh, this is how we're thinking, but it's not necessarily the way that God is acting towards us in Christ. There's another way of doing things that we're getting from Christ. Really, we're getting a God uh, that doesn't want to leave anybody out. We're getting a, a God who has acted very inclusively first to reach out to everybody. It's actually almost the opposite way of doing things. Everybody's been included, and there are people that push away. And, and pull out of it. So, so an awful lot of the book and its length is trying to deprogram people in the wrong way of thinking and reprogram them with this healthier way of understanding God and so that when we get to Paul, we can see that this is what he's talking about as well. He's on the same page as we are. So how do you find it being received? What kind, <laughs> what kind, of, what kind of feedback are you getting uh, to be To be honest, there's been a full spectrum of responses from this is absurd rubbish to this has changed my life forever. I mean, pretty much everything on the way through, on them all. Um, quite a lot more enthusiasm than I thought I would get and, and a lot more attention than I thought I would get. I think when you're writing a book like this, you worry that when you're finished, that it'll drop into a black hole and no one will talk about it. Well, a lot of people are talking about it. I get a little frustrated with what they say at times. I don't feel... I'm being understood all, all the time. I don't feel that like my arguments are being presented terribly accurately at all times, but people are trying uh, to break through, and, and I appreciate that. Now, there's a bit of a generational thing going on as well. There are a lot of scholars that have written equally large books on Paul and Romans, and I'm challenging what they're doing, threatening them. It's very hard for them to turn around and say, gee, I've been wrong about this all this time, if they have been wrong. Uh, the younger generation, the doctoral student, postdoctoral type of student uh, seems to be very excited about it all. Um, and what do you attribute that to? What? Well, they're putting the pieces in place for their own creative research on Paul. So they're at a, at a much more malleable stage of life. I remember when I was like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so there aren't too many costs involved with them saying, gee, what I was taught was wrong. Let's run with this new paradigm. There are a lot of costs involved with the older generation turning around and saying the paradigm that they're working with. Uh, is no longer functioning. And, and this is typical. If, if it's a paradigm shift, this is how they always work. It just means that I have to be, be patient and a little bit lucky. You're not the only one who, who takes this perspective, though. I hope not. <laughs> certainly not on Paul and as a whole. There are a lot of scholars who certainly agree with me about the main thrust of his gospel. Th that is absolutely right. And I'm, I'm standing in a long tradition uh, in terms of reading Paul this way. I would, would hope that what I'm saying about Paul's gospel is in complete continuity with the way really the patristics have read him, the Cappadocians, 
um, the best parts of the Catholic tradition, orthodoxy, the best parts of the Reformation right through the modern period. So I think I'm in touch with the, the best theology of the church. It's true though that there are a lot of modern scholars reading Paul that aren't quite so thrilled with what I'm up to. But I don't, I don't always hear terribly good reasons from them why that's the case. You wouldn't attribute it entirely just to uh, their history of research and study and, and teaching, though, would you? I know what, because there are examples of major theologians who come across uh, new perspectives and, and who go with it. What is the attraction to holding yeah. on to a view of Paul that is uh, mm. uh, more judgmental than uh, Graceville? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Whether we acknowledge it or not, our theology is always in play when we're reading Paul, and it's, it's always being scrutinized by that, so we're very, very defensive about it. And if we're not crystal clear on certain theological positions, uh, we will lapse into a conditionality and a sort of a contractualism. If we're not vigilant, that we don't do that. If we're not 100% committed to a gospel that is unconditional, that is a gospel what of is, grace. What is, when you say conditionality and, right. and contractual, yeah. you're driving it what? Uh, what I'm saying is uh, certain people present our relationship with God in a way that basically is a contract. And they talk about it as a covenant, but it's a contract. And a contract is something where I will do something for you if you fulfill certain conditions first. So it's always an if-then structure. Uh, and this is how we run our society. This is how we run our families half the time, unfortunately. This is how we run our politics. And this is how we run our theology. It, but it, it, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of the way God deals with us. So I'll give you salvation if you exactly. do certain things. Exactly. It seems very natural to us. It's an easy way. It slips off the tongue, doesn't it? But it's a fundamental corruption of the gospel. Once you put that little word if in, you have destroyed the gospel of grace. It's as simple as that. And a covenant, by contrast, then? A covenant properly understood. Unfortunately, people have debased the use of the word because they've, they've talked about the covenant, but then they've talked about it contractually, which is what it really isn't. We learn about what a covenant is, the covenant, in fact, uh, from looking at how God has related to us in Christ. It's as simple as that. And it, it's clearly, utterly, unconditional. It's unconditional, it's benevolent, it's loving, it's his choice of us from before the foundation of the world to, to be in fellowship with him and transformed by him. That's what a covenant is. Um, and there are no conditions, there are no strings attached. There's no if, there's no but. And this the, is, in, the, in the Old Testament it's full of that, isn't it? The, uh, well it is and it isn't. It depends I, how you read it. Mm. Well the idea that mm. I will be faithful mm. to my covenant uh, regardless of what you do. Right, right, right. Um, yes, I very much so. I change not exactly. in my covenant faithfulness, therefore exactly. you are not destroyed. Exactly. Um, people think that um, what, what tends to happen here is a little mistake. Uh, people shift from what God is expecting of us in the covenant relationship and they turn those things into a condition. So God lays out that which is really expected of us and appropriate of us, the way we should respond to God in this relationship and we like to turn that into a contract. We like to introduce these little conditions uh, for all sorts of ultimately pretty sad reasons. But this is the great battle that's going on for the interpretation of Paul. This is the, the struggle, I think, that's going on for his understanding at the moment. And the stakes are so high, this is why the conflict um, is at times so strong. And people are so wedded to the conditional contractual gospel this is why they fight back so hard. and it, it, It's a tragedy, really, that so many good folk in the church have been taught that God is a God of conditions. And so they're defending the true gospel when they push back on a reading that I'm offering, which is a reading based and rooted in grace. If you take grace unconditionally, right. doesn't that level the playing field, as it were? In other words, there's no room for me to say, well, I've been faithful in, in, in this way and that way, and you haven't, so I deserve more than you. You need to be 
condemned, and, I, and I'm going to, right. uh, we automatically think that way. I am superior here in some sense. Yes. Yeah, so right. we need to find some way of setting that up. Yeah. <laughs> and so exactly therefore, right. <laughs> therefore, we have to stand on that uh, in order have to, to introduce uh, conditions. Yeah. That's right. It's, it's a sad reflection on anything. I mean, it too. seems rather base way of, of looking at it, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's sinful, isn't it? Uh, it's religious. Yeah. It is. It's religion as opposed at its to heart. gospel. R religion at its heart, as opposed to gospel. Exactly. That's exactly right. Well, I wish we had more time to uh, to go further. The name of the book, The Deliverance of God. Uh, when we get together again, I would like to talk about why you chose the title, The Deliverance of God. But uh, be happy to talk about that'll that. that'll be for another time. You've been watching. You're included. A production of Grace Communion International.